As we hurtle headlong into the digital age, pause to ponder just how far we've come. The 80s generation had no dot com, no digital. The future they imagined has been transformed by a technology revolution. My, how we've changed. Welcome to a short history of the modern world, charting the good and bad of a quarter century of innovation. This is Stop Rewind. Advances in medical technology over the last 25 years have allowed human beings to live longer, stronger and better than at any time in history. Illnesses that were once a death sentence have become treatable, curable and, in some cases, preventable. Right now, you're going to see how those breakthroughs happen. So, slip on your scrubs, don your mask, sterilise those instruments and bring me 20 mils of adrenaline. It's often been said that laughter is the best medicine, but can you prove it? Well, two American doctors tried by tickling the funny bones of a bunch of people for an hour to see what effect it had on their bodies. Research on the stress has shown that stress suppresses your immune system. And so with knowing that stress suppressing the immune system, we want to ask the question, did uh, good stress or laughter have physiological changes that actually improve the immune system. Don't laugh. It's called psychoneuroimmunology, the study of how our state of mind affects our health. When blood samples from the test chucklers were analysed, they showed higher levels of good hormones and a drop in bad hormones. It seems that laughter, like sex, is one of the body's safety valves, a counterbalance to tension. So much so that laughter therapy, not for sex, became popular in cardiac recovery wards, replacing antidepressants and painkillers. <laughs> One Australian doctor went even more left of field, suggesting a death-defying antidote to modern stress. And this is it. Australian doctor Glenn Singleman combined mountain climbing and base jumping into an extreme cure-all. His theory, any mental health issues will be blown away by pure fear. Controlled fear turns to exhilaration. And I guess that exhilaration is mediated in your head by you know, chemicals like kef enkephalins and endorphins. The high comes from endorphins pumping through the brain, not adrenaline. So you could say these daredevils are really endorphin junkies. However, the catch with using extreme sports to stay stress-free and out of hospital is that you're kind of likely to end up bruised, strained, fractured and in hospital. There was some good news. With sports science in the 80s and 90s putting athletes' bodies under the microscope to make them go faster, higher and stronger. Some of these techniques may have been as painful as the injuries they were trying to prevent, like this muscle biopsy back in 1985. Yes, that's a metal skewer being stuck into that athlete's leg. Ouch. Though it's one hell of a motivator. Just imagine the coach. Hey, run another 100 meters in 10.5 or I'll do another muscle biopsy on you. On the topic of sticking painful looking things into people, you guessed it, acupuncture. Today, it's accepted by most people in the West as an alternative medicine not too different to herbal remedies. Back in the 80s, it was seen as some kind of kooky kung fu wizardry. It took medical research at places like this university in South Korea to make people think twice. Procedures, like this one on a sprained ankle, release natural chemicals into the body that may help recovery. Doesn't make it sting any less, though. 
Another remedy that struck a balance between the West and traditional cultures was this portable kidney dialysis system that was used by these Bedouin people. It involved a bag of glucose that ran into the body, which helped drain the toxins that a weak kidney couldn't handle. But these are far from being the most bizarre, painful or strange medical developments doctors were toying with. Let's have a look at some starting at the top. Brain surgery. Just the thought of it makes most of us shudder. Not to mention making your blood run cold. Literally, in the case of this man who needed an aneurysm operated on. Doctors chill the brain, stop the heart and drain the body of blood. The patient will be clinically dead for nearly an hour. That's a hell of a way to save someone's life. Suspended animation has increased the success rate of these operations. Four years later, two Chicago doctors adapted the idea and came up with a brain cooling device. Emergency workers could reduce the brain damage that can often occur in the first few minutes after the accident. Step one was simple enough. A modified bike helmet and some dry ice at about minus 80 degrees Celsius. But don't try this at home because step two was a little bit more complicated. That needed a special pump attached to the carotid artery and a new class of drugs back then called Lazaroids, named after the guy in the Bible who rose up and lived again. The idea of lowering body temperature was first used in heart operations in the 50s. But in the early 90s, economic necessity forced a bunch of Siberian doctors to take it to extremes. If this operating theatre looks sparsely equipped, that's because a barrage of expensive equipment is missing. Barely a machine that goes in sight. Instead, there was something Siberia had bucket loads of. Ice. Enough to cool this four-year-old boy's body to 24 degrees, his brain to 18 degrees, and his heart to just 16 degrees. Now, in theory, the heart can survive for up to 90 minutes without suffering damage when stopped. It's much safer for the patient if the operation can be performed in around half that time, which means 45 minutes to repair one hole and two faulty valves. All in a day's work. Well, actually, no. While they are sewing up the boy's chest next door, here in another room, they've already started the next operation. All up that year, the team performed about 1,500 operations. Do the maths on that one. Over in the West, doctors took a more high-tech approach when it came to matters of the heart. I feel like I got 10 years going right now. We hope you do. In 1985, William J. Schroeder became the second man to receive a Jarvik 7, the best known of the early artificial hearts. Although he survived for 620 days, he suffered three major strokes. It sparked intense moral and ethical debate, but it didn't stop further research and development. As someone wise once said, why bother with a pound of cure when you can have one ounce of prevention? Or five fluid ounces, to be more accurate. After you've had a sip of wine, you've probably noticed a tangy aftertaste in your mouth. Well, that's due to the flavonoids in wine, which give it its colour and flavour. But even better than that, they may protect our hearts against heart disease. The French, who drink around 70 litres of wine per head annually, have one of the lowest rates of heart disease in the world. And that's why a local company turned this into this. A daily red wine pill, the equivalent of two glasses a day. This cheeky little number was actually made from wine pulp. Easy on the kidneys because it didn't contain alcohol and good for the heart because it thins the blood. Given the choice between taking a capsule and drinking the real thing, well, I am in Paris after all. Votre santé. Which brings us rather conveniently to blood. Oh, come on, you can't make a medical show without spilling some blood. Anyway, it's not real. Back in 1989, the Japanese came up with a recipe for artificial blood. It was cheap, 
compatible with all types and able to be made by adding water to a powder base. By mucking around with the levels, the Japanese version could be made more efficient than the genuine article. But Israeli scientists were already one step better. These crystals are the bloody equivalent to instant coffee, freeze-dried blood. On the shelf, it could be stored at room temperature and last indefinitely. Theoretically, it would be used during transplant surgery or for extending the life of donor organs. Despite being developed over a number of decades, artificial blood is still to be perfected. However, there is one big advantage with it. It has no blood types. You can't get any problems in cross-matching. It can be autoclaved. That means it can be totally sterilized, so there's no problems with virus, hepatitis, or AIDS, or what have you. And on the topic of AIDS, no illness gained more headlines over the past 25 years. AIDS is a disease right now which is 100% fatal. This virus does things we just haven't seen before, not only for viruses, but for all of biology. Maybe the cure will come along. Right. Maybe it won't. And if it doesn't, I'm one of the casualties of the war, if you would. By 1986, 25,000 cases of AIDS had been reported worldwide. Yet less than 10 years after it first came to prominence, scientists had not only identified the virus, but were already on the path to treating it. Sadly, though, we are still waiting for the big breakthrough. But there's been better news for another major killer. A vaccine against cancer. It sounds like science fiction, but it's real. According to the World Health Organization, more than 48,000 people die each year from melanoma skin cancers. In 1990, a trial injected deactivated cancer cells into melanoma patients to create antibodies, and it had promising results. If the vaccine was successful here under trial conditions, then the next step would be to release it as a regular vaccine, but that's still to happen. Some techniques, though, were a little more unorthodox. Like this 1990 research, which suggested cuttlefish ink might be the latest weapon in the fight against cancer. That's right, cuttlefish ink. A Japanese scientist purified the ink and injected it into mice with tumours. To his astonishment, 60% of them recovered. The study is still in its early stages. But its findings will ensure that in the future, science will be as curious about these creatures as this one seems to be about me. Sadly, this inky new biotechnology never went anywhere. So for countries where showing a bit of skin was all the rage, the challenge was still on to stop skin cancers caused by the sun. One research project looked at the natural method that tropical coral uses to protect itself from sun damage. It creates a natural sunscreen, avoiding any of the suspected side effects that they believed suntan lotions had back in 1987. Most suntan creams and lotions use amino benzoic acid derivatives. Turnover, please. But at least one authority in the United States is now saying that although these creams may prevent sunburn, they can in fact cause skin cancer. Still, in a few years' time, who knows? We may be spreading artificial coral onto our backs. A few years later, and medical research went to the dogs, literally. Meet Tangles, a two and a half year old cocker spaniel with a very important job. He's been trained to sniff out bladder cancer. Okay, his style's a little off the leash, but as you can see, he could sniff out the urine sample of a cancer patient from a lineup of samples from healthy patients. Tangles even detected cancer in a sample that was meant to be cancer free. So they, they took the sample back to the hospital and discovered they had cancer of the kidney. Two 
2006 was the year cancer specialists finally had their holy grail. Specifically, a vaccine for the human papillomavirus, the cause of cervical cancer. Most vaccines are made by growing viruses in the lab, and that method wouldn't work for this one. The solution? A cunning plan to trick another virus into thinking it was the human papillomavirus. Take out the real viral material inside, inject the inactive outer shell, and bingo. The final clinical phase of the trials were completed back in 2005 with stunning results. The vaccine has proved to be 100% effective. The scientists also developed a vaccine for anyone who can't do without their regular fix of paint stripper, acid, insecticide, mothballs, and lighter fluid toxins, otherwise known as cigarette smoke. It was based on a new class of experimental drugs that create antibodies, which attach themselves to nicotine particles, making them too large to be absorbed by the brain. Oh, I saved millions of lives worldwide. Not to mention making one Swiss company very, very rich. Four, five, six, seven, eight. That little boy had problems with his vision. But back in 1985, they learnt how to fix problems like that one with a donated cornea from a deceased person. The transplanted part was sewn into the front of the patient's eye. It was safe, had a 90% plus success rate, and if anything went wrong, it could easily be removed. Within a decade, surgeons were experimenting with photoreceptors attached to the back of the eye to bypass damaged retinas. If you can replace eyes, why not noses and ears? Sometimes I'll take the ear off and set it on the table and say, guys, I gotta go, but I don't want to miss anything. We got removable facial features, thanks to a Swedish doctor who experimented with titanium implants. He tried them first on dogs, a little too successfully. We enjoyed seeing them chew whatever they wanted to chew and a little bit uh, outside of that as well, of course, the cages and foreign visitors and so forth. <laughs> Trouble with your knee ligaments? No problem. Back in 85, they learned how to replace human ligaments with new ones made from carbon fibre. Damaged skin could be replaced. At first artificially, and not long after, it was the real thing. Tissue cultures grown directly from just three square centimetres of patient skin. Theoretically, it's possible to reproduce the pieces 10,000 times over. Eventually, though, it even came from someone else. Someone who would probably never miss it. This is a portion of an infant's foreskin. It's highly valued medically because, like all infant's skin, it grows vigorously. So much so that it could put new life into their grandparents' old skin. Talk about a chip off the old block. And then hip and knee replacements also became commonplace. It is a miracle that ha what has happened to me and to many people here. Thanks to increasingly sophisticated materials, we can look much further and grow. There is virtually no major joint in the body which cannot be replaced. Not just replace. Divide the artificial bone into a few separate pieces. Chuck in a powerful electromagnet or two, and suddenly we could grow those bones just like normal ones, without invasive operations and painful rehab. 25 years ago, who would have thought the fountain of youth would be found in a vial of poison? This was Clostridium botulinum, one of the deadliest neurotoxins. It also knocks out wrinkles, which is why its commercial form, Botox, has been the best friend of women and a few men since the early 90s. Everyone my age will be knocking down the doors and uh... I'm really very excited about it. Some ideas save lives, but fixing a vibrating soft palate, better known as snoring, can save a marriage. Insert a plastic implant to stop the vibrating and a good night's sleep for all. Perhaps one day, all diagnosis will be as much fun as this short-lived innovation from the 80s. Many people have told us it sounds like Tinkle Tinkle Little Star. You've heard of musical chairs, but what about musical urine? 
That's right, setting a urine analysis to music in order to diagnose a body that's out of tune. Would it be possible to produce a professional musical score of a urine that could be performed by a uh, chamber music uh, group or a string quartet or a full symphony orchestra, perhaps? I don't know. Uh, go ahead and laugh. Remember, it could well be the best medicine. It was good enough for Beethoven. Surely you've heard of his third movement? Here's another different take on something we've been doing since the birds and the bees first got together. The birthing wheel. Designed by a Swiss artist, it's a suspended chair that allowed women to position themselves how they wanted during birth. Men are very... Uh much taken by the remote control and up and down and back and forward. They think this is great. Anything that's technical at all, remote control, they find absolutely fantastic. And once the baby was born, they could use an itty bitty spacesuit to keep them safe and sound. This development came from the European space program in the mid nineties. The suits contained sensors that monitored a baby's health. Any problems and an alarm could be sounded and the baby given the medical care required. But for the final word on medicine, the body and all things fleshy, we'll journey into the future world of cyborgs. Part man, part machine. This is Stella, a performance artist who believes the body is obsolete. Stellark developed technology whereby his body could fit into an electric exoskeleton that was then controlled by other people via a touchscreen system. He also created robotic secondary limbs. I guess you'd never have to ask anyone to lend you a hand again. In a world of artificial limbs, re-engineered blood and transplanted skin, perhaps Stellark was asking what and who is the real person. Ten years later, and life imitates art, with cyborg limbs becoming a reality. An artificial leg that is remotely controlled by a sensor operating off the movement of the other leg. It's real, and it works. Far smoother than a normal artificial leg. This bionic leg, developed in Canada, even had a shock absorber system to make it react more like the muscles of a human leg. Scientists had started not only implanting parts for the body that were like the real thing, but putting in parts that were the real thing, freshly grown in the lab. And what we have here is uh, a heart valve. And you can see here this machine actually providing the action uh, for the heart valve. It's conditioning the heart valve. So when you implant it, it's ready to function. So it's strengthening the heart valve? It is strengthening basically. the tissue as it's being formed, yes. It was a process that appeared simple. The cells for each organ were taken from the patient, then grown in a nutrient-rich environment. These were then coated onto a biodegradable scaffold the same shape as the body part. This was incubated, then transplanted into the patient. Who knows where it will all end? We're living longer and healthier than at any time in human history. Sure, no one's discovered the fountain of youth. Yet, it's only a matter of time. <laughs>